I was in a boring scrum meeting. Uh, show of hands, who has the misfortune of knowing what the fuck a scrum meeting is? I'm sorry for your loss. Um, so the idea behind a scrum meeting is that you're supposed to get up and you're supposed to say what you did yesterday and what you're doing today so that uh, if two people are working on the same problem, that they can know that and not butt heads. And then also so that um, like you have a general idea of what other people on a large team are working on, uh, just so that you know what others help you might be able to offer and shortcuts and stuff. Um, the meeting is called a stand-up meeting because it's supposed to be very fast and you're supposed to get it over with and then do meaningful work. So I wound up in these hour-long scrum meetings every morning, the first hour of my workday would be uh, saying what I did the day before, saying what I did that day, and then listening to 12 other people do the same thing as all of us were encouraged to make our descriptions as long and involved as possible. Because, you know, yesterday, um, you know, I, I walked down to the town and we couldn't find the beer bar and we looked around and then we found the beer bar, but it was closed. And, and, and these the stories would ramble on like that as, and everyone was like motivated to do it in that style, just all the possible details. So that an eighth of the workday was wasted in this meeting. And if this sounds motivating, like it, it just gets the day on the right foot, you know, as essential as a cup of coffee, it was not like that. It was painful. And during these meetings, you know, I, I tried to be a good sport about it. I tried to uh, be nice about it. Uh, so I, I kept my phone in my pocket. And this is more self-control than the greatest uh, yogi or dervish has ever had in history. To be able to sit there knowing that I had angry birds in my pocket and I could not play it because I was in the scrum meeting. So I started looking at my wristwatch and thinking about how much cooler the wristwatch should be. So I designed this, which is the good watch. This is, um, a re this is a, effectively like a clone of the Casio 3208 watch module, which they use in all of their currently manufactured uh, calculator watches. Uh, this does not work in the antique ones. These are not the ones that you had as a child, um, unless you still are a child. Uh, so the the watch itself is, as you open it up, it has like a circuit board inside, and the circuit board connects to the LCD display, and it connects to the keypad, and it has two side buttons and a battery and a piezo speaker on the back, and that's it. But all of these pieces connect at particular places, and you can match those connectors. So if I matched those connectors, I could make my own circuit board with my own chip in it. And while I was at it, I could add a couple of extra features. Um, currently, the coolest thing that it can do is uh, a frequency counter that scans the entire 70 megahertz spectrum, both amateur and commercial, in about two seconds, telling me the frequency of a handheld radio transmitter within um, like 100 kilohertz. So if uh, so I was at my neighborhood bar, I wanted to know the frequency of the two-way radios that they used. Not my neighborhood bar, because they don't use two-way radios, but like the, the concert venue nearby, right? Uh, and so I just held the, the radio next to the watch, and I hit the button, and I keyed up the radio, and then I knew their frequency, and then I could jump onto their radio network and participate in it without a software-defined radio and without a laptop. Um, this has uh, more than a year of battery life, this runs on uh, a low-powered uh, Chipcon device from Texas Instruments. So it uses the same radio core as Steph's thermostat uses. Uh, so it's compatible with a lot of different things. I have this uh, ringing my doorbell. I have it raising and lowering the antenna mast on my truck. Uh, so in this lecture, I'm going to show you like a bit about uh, how this project works and what's necessary to pay attention to in order to make all of the, uh, to make it actually like a, a stable product, something that you can wear reliably without, without cussing at it or having it fail at an opportune moment, moments. Right. So there, there's a bit of related work. There's uh, what's called the Pluto watch. This is, um, so the Casio F91W is popular with mathematicians and apparently terrorists. There was, um, like this 
big moral panic around uh, bomb making guides, and one of the, the guides shows how to make a bomb that goes off when the timer from the swatch rings. Um, so, of course, this is the first one to have a replacement board made. Um, the fellow who cloned this one used uh, an MSP430 and a compass. So this will tell you like which way is north. So as you jump out of an unfamiliar subway or U-Bahn station at night, you can use this to immediately orient yourself and know which way is which. Um, he used infrared so that he could pro reprogram this watch without actually opening the case. And his uh, source code and his power management tools are all open along with the hardware on GitHub. So you can grab this watch, you can manufacture it. Um, TI themselves made uh, a smartwatch using the same radio CPU that I use, the Chipcon 430F6137. Uh, they called it the TI Kronos. Um, this was a really cool development kit when it came out, and everybody bought it. And then um, they didn't actually wear it because this thing is as big as like a government GPS ankle monitor. Uh, you really feel like you're a prisoner when you're wearing the thing. Um, the watch band is very, uh, not only is the watch case very thick, but the, the band is like stiff rubber. So um, as you wear it in the summer, it forms like a little lake of sweat that doesn't go away and doesn't dry off. And then the sweat dissolves the rubber, and then it becomes even more uncomfortable. Um, there were cool things with this, though. Um, even though the hardware is mostly proprietary, um, you get no CAD files, but only a blurry JPEG of the schematics. And the compression is too high to read most of the component values. Um, but the, the firmware was very quickly forked by the open source community and there are GitHub projects that are still maintained with good firmware for this device. Um, it has an accelerometer, a compass, and all of the fancy extra features that, uh, that you might expect in such a thing. Um, there's also the Faraday RF board. This is made for the 900 megahertz amateur radio band that uh, we have in North America that you do not have here. Um, so this transmits with half a watt um, straight out to an SMA connector. Um, and this was designed to be like the first commercial radio that you could buy for the 900 megahertz band intended for the amateur market. Um, in the States, when we use the 900 megahertz band for our own use, we have to buy old commercial equipment and then reband it by adjusting the filters and, and reprogramming it. It's painful. So the Faraday RF guys came out with this as a completely open project with um, open hardware, open firmware, open host software to make a 900 megahertz modem that could be used over long distances by any operator. And then uh, Michael Osman and I, uh, that's him on the right and me on the left, we took this children's toy called the GirlTech IM Me, which uses the Chipcon 1110, which is an 8051 microcontroller and the Chipcon radio. And then we came up with replacement uh, firmware images for it. They did things like turn it into a spectrum analyzer. Uh, we had a video game or two for it. Um, it's got a full dot matrix display and a large comfortable keyboard, so it's easy to type in something complicated. Um, Mike was opening and closing his garage door with it. Um, so the, the radio is really versatile. It's just that you feel a little bit strange carrying around um, like a pink toy that's larger than uh, my handheld radio. You want something smaller. There's also the, the RF cat or the yardstick one. Um, this is kind of cool because it's uh, programmed in host side Python. So this is just the Chipcon radio controlled by a Python API so that you can very quickly play with the register settings until you're transmitting and receiving the, the packets accurately without ever reflashing the firmware. The initial design I made by measuring the Casio chip. So here I've got my vernier caliper and the Casio board, and I'm measuring the width, which is 25 and a half uh, millimeters. Uh, I marked up all of these measurements on paper and then transferred them to KiCad so that I wound up with a KiCad model of what my PCB would look like. Um, the 
same has to be done for the back side. And then I can clone it into my own design. Um, in this case, the row of pins at the top, that is the um, LCD connector. So those connect to the display. And then this row of pins at the bottom, that is the um, keypad connector. Um, if you match the same pins and you talk to them in the same way, you're compatible. So all I needed to do is to figure out what each pin meant and then tie it into the microcontroller. And after that, it became a software problem. Now, the CPU that I used, the Chipcon 430 F6137, it has 32 kilobytes of flash, 4 kilobytes of SRAM, uh, a 96 segment LCD built into the chip so that I don't need an external LCD controller. It also has a sub-gigahertz radio built into the chip so that I don't need an external radio. And it has a ROM bootloader so that I can flash it over a serial port without having to have a JTAG cable. Um, this is important because I had so very little space, right? And having little space, if I could knock the design down to a single chip, that made the layout a lot easier. And it allowed me to keep the watch uh, as thin as the original board so that it could fit into the original case. Um, this is the initial prototype as I first brought it up while wired into a development uh, cable board. When you're developing something like this, your end result is going to be something that you can wear on your wrist. But that's not what your first prototype should look like. You should begin by making something that you can directly develop with, because the purpose of your initial prototype is to support your development. It's not to be your final product. So in this case, the wires come out of the device and allow me to freely reflash the device and to dump dmessage logs from the kernel so that I'm able to use printf debugging and logging to know what went wrong. Uh, and again, I'm just matching the, the same positions. So the board on the left is my clone, the Goodwatch 10. The board on the right is the original Casio. Um, you'll, you see those little pieces of blue? Those are, uh, uh, what do you call them, uh, sticky notes. So I take a sticky note and a razor blade, and I cut the sticky note apart. And then I cover up the pins that I am not going to wire to the chip. So in the board on the right, I've disabled, um, I think it's seven of the LCD pins. Uh, one on, or two on the far left, and then uh, four, on the, four or five on the right. The reason is that the original Casio device has more LCD pins than my microcontroller has. And I have to make sure that I'm compatible, and I have to do this before I actually have the software working. So by covering up those pins, I then know that it's safe not to wire them, because I see on the regular watch running Casio's firmware exactly what support gets dropped, which uh, pixels can't be lit. <coughs> This is the board drafted in KiCad. Now, this black segment here is blocking uh, pins on the far left of the connector. Those pins are what we call common pins because they connect to large groups of pixels on the display. If you block any one of these, you will disable uh, one quarter of the pixels in the display. These pins, the vast majority of them, these are called segment pins. And they're segment pins because um, they connect one pixel as a segment to the common pin that you've selected earlier. If I block one of these, then up to four pixels will go dead. So I need to, so I need to know which ones are acceptable not to wire. And then I also need to know um, which pixels connect to which pair of a common pin and a segment pin in order to program the LCD controller. So I figure out the, um, the common pins by blocking one at a time. So first I block the far left one, and I see that a quarter of the pixels disappear. So I know that's a common pin. And the same with the second, and the same with the third, and the same with the fourth. After that, 
I then know that the, the far left ones are the common pins and that the rest are the segment pins and I can wire them up to the chip accordingly. But I don't want to have to run through and like block each and every individual one and then, figure, and then block all of the pairs and figure out all of the pixel combinations on the real hardware. So there's a trick that you can do. Once I knew the types, I just wired them up as they were physically convenient rather than by any electrical reasoning because I wanted as few wires to cross as possible. I then, using my handy development kit, which you see in the background, flashed this watch with code that lit up every single pixel. And over here on the far right, you see that there's this little like down thing with two right segments and then nothing after it? Originally, that would show the day of the week. On my watch, I can't show the day of the week there because those are the pixels that I missed. But I now know that all of these are lit properly, and now I can begin to figure out like, which ones go where. And the trick is to do that by software. So I created two CPU processor definitions because I always want this in line for um, uh, code optimization reasons by the compiler. Uh, I, I toss these in. One of them draws a point, and then the other clears a point. And then I, I drew tables that connect a... By the address, I have the number of the, um, of the digit, right? So the, I have eight digits. And then I also have the, um, the segment within the digit. I have eight of those because I have the, the seven segments of the number display plus the period at the bottom. I constructed this table by lighting, pin, by lighting up one pixel at a time, seeing which one it was, and then populating that section of the table. So that this became a software problem that I could solve without having to investigate the original physical hardware. Because as I'm cloning something, I want to be free of having to physically touch the original sample as quickly as possible. Because it's a lot of work to uh, do this by hand when you could instead do it by software. The C code has to be built, right? So I've got this board. There are test clips in this photograph that are connecting it to the serial programmer. And it's... Uh, it's flashed by GCC using the standard GNU toolchain. So you can build this on regular Debian just by installing the correct packages. You don't need um, any third-party tools. You don't need the vendor libraries. You don't need a commercial IDE. You don't have to join the manufacturer's social network. All of this can be built in regular Linux. I then had to figure out how the keyboard was wired. And again, I did this by software. So I knew that some of the pins were inputs and some of them were outputs. I then set all of them weakly low except for one that I set high, and then I pressed a button to figure out which pair got connected. And at the end, I figured out that um, the columns on the display are 2.1, 2 2.0, 2.2, 2.0, and 1.7. So those are the column pins of the keypad. And then 2.3, 2.4, 2.5, and 2.6 are the rows of the keypad. If you press a button, let's say that you press the 7 button, which is in the top left corner, you are electrically connecting pin 2.3 to pin 2.2. Electricity flows between them. I have all of these as outputs pulled high by default, all of the columns, and I have all of the rows as inputs weakly pulled low. So when you press the button here, 2.3 jumps high, which tells me that the top row is being selected. And then I flip it. So I make these inputs, I make these low, and this one high, and then I just check to see which one of these became high. And that tells me that it was 2.2. And this is how the, the keypad is scanned. By scanning the keypad, I then know which button was pressed. And I can do this on an interrupt edge. So instead of having a busy loop like you might have in a video game, instead I have a CPU interrupt that is fired when one of these pins notices its input change. 
And in that way, I'm able to react instantly to a button press rather than waiting for the next video frame. That matters because I want as few video frames as possible in order to save computation and thus battery life. This can then be extended to come up with a table in which the byte of the scan code gets converted to the byte of ASCII. Because in the handler, you'd much rather write uh, a handler that, that runs from the ASCII equipment to uh, from the ASCII equivalent of the button press to keep your source code readable. Power management matters a lot on this platform. Uh, I have a CR2016 coin cell. It is 20 millimeters in diameter and 1.6 millimeters thick. It has 100 milliamps that have to survive until the end of the device's lifetime. So I started measuring some power. At 32 kilohertz, my CPU takes only five microamps. That gives me more than a year and a half, two years of battery life. At one megahertz, it takes 160 microamps, which gives me like a week of battery life. So I run the entire CPU at 32 kilohertz in order to keep all of the switching slow, in order to keep the battery consumption low, in order to optimize the idle time. But I can jump the CPU to the higher clock rate when I have to do something important. Uh, for example, when the calculator is doing a large division or multiplication, it will jump up to 1 megahertz for just that operation and then jump down afterward. Um, the calculator itself is one of a number of applications. There's also uh, a timer so that you can measure the, uh, how long an event took. Um, there's a hex editor, which I particularly like. So uh, I took this photograph at Hacktivity. And I flew out to Hacktivity from New York City through, uh, I think it was Istanbul. Um, so I, I couldn't bring many tools with me because the, the goons at the airport would steal them. So uh, what I did was I put a hex editor into the watch. And when I got to Budapest, the watch on the left had accurate time, but the watch on the right was losing two minutes per day. So I used the hex editor, and I looked up the data sheet for the chip. And the data sheet told me that there was a, a control register for the real-time clock, and there was a flag in that register that would turn high if the real-time clock had a failure in the hardware crystal and went to its backup of a resistor capacitor timer. Sure enough, the watch on the left does not have that bit set because it has good timing. The watch on the right does have that bit set because it has bad timing. And I was able to accurately identify that the crystal was the problem through the hex editor before I even opened the watch. So that when I did open the watch, and I had a janky hackerspace soldering iron with a loose tip, and uh, this godforsaken lead-free solder, um, I knew exactly where to go into the device. I had one component and then the two pins that connected to it, and there was nowhere else for me to inspect on this device so that I could find the mistake and correct it as quickly as possible. Now, if you have a hex editor, you need a disassembler. So uh, I implemented that as a standalone C program that runs on the host laptop and can then uh, be cross-compiled to run within the watch as well so that I can use test cases to know that the dis disassembler is accurate before I actually deploy it so that I don't have to uh, like read large programs in order to know that it's right. I have a power on self-test. So when I found out that the crystal had failed in Budapest through manually using the hex editor, I never ever wanted to have to do it again for that problem. So I wrote code that tests the, uh, that tests everything that it can within the watch, among it the error flags of all of the peripherals. So if the real-time clock fails again, my watch will tell me through the power on self-test which, I can, which runs at start, and also when I press the 7 key. So if I press 7 on my watch that I'm wearing, it says all good, meaning that all of the tests have passed. If it fails, it'll tell me like the, the low frequency crystal is bad, 
or that there's no radio, or whatever failed in that individual watch, so that I can take all of the guesswork out of diagnosing problems that I've already seen. I then needed to make a second revision of the hardware, because we don't have a radio yet. So the radio requires a second crystal, which runs at 26 megahertz. And it also requires a filter chain, because um, when you transmit on one frequency, you also transmit on its harmonics unless you filter them out. And while I really don't give a damn if I transmit on the harmonics of a coin, uh, coin cell operated uh, watch, amateur radio operators will complain about it. And when they complain about it, I get emails. And the emails take time. So I threw in a bandpass filter for 435 megahertz. Um, the newer version of the Good Watch is expanded to have a low-pass filter set at either 450 megahertz or at 950 megahertz. So that I, with the 950 megahertz model, I have all frequencies with a couple of gaps from 300 megahertz to 1 gigahertz that I can receive and transmit on. Um, so the watch itself supports uh, 300 to 348 megahertz, 389 to 464, 779 to 928, um, with the filter limiting it to 430 to 435. The filter gets extended in the next model. I also needed an antenna. Um, so in ham radio, you have what's called a, wire, a random wire antenna. Well, when I've got this watch and the band is stainless steel, and stainless steel is conductive, I might as well use that as my antenna. So this little green wire connects the circuit board inside of the watch to the watch band outside of it and allows the, um, the watch to transmit with an antenna that is far longer than I could ever fit inside of the device. The standing wave ratio of this is awful, except in the... Um, uh, in the uh, ladies' model of the watch, taken off and set on a table, it happens to accidentally tune exactly to uh, a standing wave ratio of 1 to 1 at 434 megahertz. Um, you also need software for the radio, right? You need to, when you add a, a feature that requires extra soldering, uh, for something that will be built by hand, your feature has to be optional. So every feature that has been extended into this watch will support a graceful downgrade. If you build the watch without the RF crystal, the watch recognizes at startup that it's unable to start up the radio crystal, disables the radio features, but otherwise works. Similarly, when I added support for a newer model of the CPU that broke backward compatibility in hardware, I snuck around that in software so that all of my drivers will correctly load in either chip. You also need a, a way to develop your radio applications away from the, the watch model. You need to be able to figure out your radio settings in Unix from the command line with a Python script and then later port it to run as C code within the device where it's more complicated to make changes. Um, so this here is a, a standard FTDI adapter wired into a good watch board that has a chip antenna soldered onto the front. And then a Python library is able to load in the settings for the radio to cause the transmission or reception um, so that all of the settings can be figured out away from the watch interface and the C code. And then only after they're working do I port them over to the C code, where I know that they'll work on the first try. Um, the watch has selectable frequencies, right? In the same way that my handheld radio does. But there are some frequencies that I'll use very often. So there's a text file of the frequencies that will be loaded into the watch along with their names. And this gets flashed into a special area of flash memory that's not erased as the firmware is updated. We call it the code plug. Um, so that you can have like a common list of frequencies that's unique to your environment or your local stations. 
radio power management matters just as much as the regular power management. So I have five microamps when the radio is off and the CPU is at 32 kilohertz. I have 160 microamps. It's, uh, 300, uh, it's uh, 32 times as much power consumption when I jump the CPU up to one megahertz. I have 15,000 microamps being consumed when I receive, and I have between 15 and 30,000 microamps when I transmit. So th this creates a couple of things that might be unintuitive before you, you work with the particular platform, such as that whether my CPU is running at 32 kilohertz or one megahertz while I'm using the radio is pocket change. It costs me nothing that I can measure because the radio is consuming all of the power. So whenever I'm in a radio application, I'm happy to jump up the CPU frequency in order to be able to react faster or um, anything else. It's effectively free. The other thing to note is that for current consumption, receiving is, if not exactly as expensive, it's within 50% um, of the cost of transmitting. And transmitting is usually for a briefer amount of time because you can transmit it and then f stop and forget about it. So any sort of communications protocol that this might uh, use long term has to be something in which the watch beacons out and gets a reply immediately. Uh, Nordic RF does this in their shock burst protocols in order to make very low power uh, wireless keyboards. Um, so in my case, like I have a, um, a Morse code transmitter, I have a frequency counter. For all of these features, I have to turn the radio off when I'm not using it, and I have to receive as little as possible. So my frequency counter requires you to press the button to begin counting the, the frequency. It does one sweep through and then stops until it's told to continue. And by minimizing the time that I spend with the radio on, I'm able to maximize my battery life. I have a Morse code mode in which I can transmit CW from my wristwatch to uh, a waiting radio. This photograph was taken at a bar in West Philadelphia. I was able to transmit the signal as Morse code across four city blocks to a receiver who is accurately writing down the, the results in a bar. Um, And it just comes in as standard single sideband. Like you, you can have um, any standard amateur radio that supports single sideband broadcast receive this. But it's rather costly as far as the, um, the power consumption goes, right? Because you're, um, you're keeping the transmitter on for the entire duration that your key is down. And you'd really rather not do that. So you can support fancier protocols. Um, this is a 4FSK beacon, which is probably closer to the protocols that uh, other ChipCon devices, such as Steph's uh, thermostat, will use in the wild. Um, one thing that's particularly fun to play with are these cheap 433 megahertz remote controls. Um, you can buy these for nothing online. Um, they usually transmit at 433.92 megahertz. Um, and they just come with a couple of remote controls and then a receiver unit that you wire into whatever your weird project is. So uh, there's a program called Universal Radio Hacker, uh, which allows you to record these signals with your SDR. And then you just drag a cursor to figure out how wide a bit is. You tell it how wide a bit is, and it tells you what the packets are. Um, you then copy those packets and the speed and the modulation into a watch module, um, which will look like this in your source code. And from these settings, you now have everything to begin retransmitting those packets. I then create uh, an array of those packets in memory in order, and then um, I have like a unique one per watch. So on my watch, if I press zero in the OOK application, it will ring my doorbell. If I press uh, one, two, three, or four 
it moves the antenna mast on my uh, TV news van so that I can raise and lower the antenna from my wristwatch. And then the, the next row, um, like five, six, seven, and eight, will uh, flip relays in my apartment so that I can turn lights on and off. Um, and and it, it, it's a much cooler remote than the original one. Um, so here the, the watch is able to, to flip the, uh, the controls on this relay. Um, and a lot of these are trainable. So once your watch is able to generate the appropriate signal, uh, there's a programming button that you can hit on the module to match it to your watch without having to do any reverse engineering of the signal. Um, so here I have the, uh, uh, an early prototype of the frequency counter. So um, when you're in a conference and people are running around with radios, like here you say, what's the frequency, Kenneth? And they say it's... 144.500. Um, but if you're in a commercial venue, it can be a lot harder, right? So if you're in a club and the bouncer has a radio, you just punch the bouncer, right? And then you hit the zero key on your watch while he radios for backup. <laughs> and then you have the, the frequency, right? Um, it's not perfectly accurate because it's functioning by jumping 100 kilohertz at a time measuring the signal strength, and then jumping to the next one. Um, but you can usually find it within 100 kilohertz, if not exactly in short order, and then use the tuning knob on your radio to find the rest without ever having to open a software-defined radio or uh, open a laptop or hunt down equipment. Um, you can do the same thing for uh, cheap radios that you buy that have no listed frequencies. So this little tiny radio on the far left is um, like uh, a tiny little belt buckle sized radio that you can buy from China, but China won't tell you what the frequency is. It turns out that it's uh, like 450 and a half, uh, which is totally illegal to transmit on in the States and Europe. Um, but once you know this, you can then program your, uh, your ham radio to use the same frequency. Um, and then uh, match the squelch tones, and then you're able to communicate with a teeny tiny radio from the, the fancy one. So that I can hand this radio to someone who's leaving my truck and say, hey, call me on this when you need a pickup so that I can tell which damn street corner you're on without fussing with the cell phone. Uh, and then you can do the same thing for uh, bars. So uh, this was the venue for security B-sides in Knoxville, Tennessee. Uh, the frequency listed is the one that the uh, conference staff were using for their radios. Um, but their radios had no display, so I figured it out by this means, and then uh, everyone could abandon their staff radios for the ones that they brought from home. Um, and uh, I like to end lectures with uh, a picture of a cat or a dog. This dog is named Ruger. He holds court at this bar, which is the Crafty Bastard Brewing Company. And um, if you uh, hold your hands like this, he'll jump up and high-five you. He's a very good dog. So uh, thank you kindly. <laughs> uh, are there any questions? Uh, so the, the chip is, uh, that, that used for the radio, for the Google Watch in the first region uh, was capable of the radio uh, radio feature. Exactly, yes. So uh, the question was, um, in, my initial in my initial prototype, the one without a radio, was the chip capable of it? Um, when I'm designing something that has a part that's tricky to lay out, like I, I, I'm not very good at radio layout, for example, um, I wanted to know that the keypad and the LCD were correct as quickly as possible. So I ordered PCB prototypes before I laid out any of the radio. So that even though the chip supported it, there was no radio crystal, there was no filter chain, there was no antenna connected. The radio was kind of useless, but if you had like excellent soldering skills, you could have attached the right parts to it. But you had it back in mind that you want to implement it too? Absolutely. Uh, from the very beginning, this was going to be a ham radio watch. 
um, even though the, the Good Watch 10 had the radio part uh, non-functional, because it was meant to verify the LCD and the keypad, uh, that was coming. So I used a, a CPU that included a radio. I knew that that was in the plan. It was part of the firmware and the power management strategy. And in the second prototype, the Good Watch 20, it came up and worked on the first try. Any other questions? Uh, yeah. I assume it uh, runs Linux. <laughs> uh, no, the watch could not run Linux. Uh, so um, Linux consumes more power starting up than I have in my entire device lifetime. Um, Linux requires a memory management unit. Uh, I have 32 kilobytes of flash memory and four kilobytes of SRAM. So instead of using an operating system, I wrote my firmware from scratch in C. Uh, I have my own minimal scheduler that works by uh, interrupt handlers. So you have uh, a structure for your current application. It has a function that gets called four times a second to redraw the LCD. And it has a function that's called when the, the application enters. It has a function called when it exits. It has a function that's called when a key is pressed. Um, there's no such thing as a, a background process or a background thread in this kernel. Because again, I, my aim is the strictest power management because I need the longest lifetime. The uh, clock application goes a step further, and it only reacts to an interrupt uh, if the, it only draws the screen if the second has changed. And then it only draws the, the ones digit unless the ones digit is a zero, and then it will draw the tens digit. Um, all of this is done to minimize the amount of work that the watch is doing, and also to, um, extend the, the battery life as far as possible. Um, it, it's also kind of nice, though, because when you look at the code base, you can see what everything does. There is no magic in it. Um, the only libc functions that I'm using are for things like uh, printf. Um, even printf is calling my own function to print a character into the buffer. And so by grepping the source code or by reading the comments, you can learn how everything in the entire operating system is functioning. And it's all documented because all of the code is documented. Uh, there's no magic inside of it. How much space is in there left for your own applications to develop? So uh, the question was, uh, how much space is left if I, if I have so little to work with? Um, there is no heap. So we have very good numbers in the RAM usage. We're using. Um, I believe 500 bytes of RAM, uh, which is uh, some of which is wasteful. Like if you need some of those bytes back, we can we can talk about it. Uh, so I've got like three and a half K or um, you know 80 percent of the RAM free. For flash, I'm using 26 kilobytes. Uh, so we're getting toward the end of it. There's only about six kilobytes left. You can disable individual applications in order to make room for others. For example, there is a, a password generator application that Alexander Nikolic wrote. Right? So this application generates a random number, uses that to look up a word in a table, and shows you the words in sequence, which you can then write down to have a random password that you stand some chance in hell of remembering. Um, that application needs a lot of flash memory because it needs a lot of words. So it's disabled by default, and for you to ena enable it, you need to maybe disable the radio applications. Um, other applications are very small. Like we have um, a Sabbath mode uh, for Orthodox Jewish users so that they can disable all of the keyboard buttons and the side button for changing the mode, leaving only the, the last side button rem remaining so that the watch can use absolutely no user-directed electricity for uh, a Saturday. Uh, if you accidentally press a button, not one transistor will flip. Um, this takes less than a kilobyte of code. So including that feature costs very little. Uh, and you might be pleasantly surprised at how little code your own application will take 
if you only need to use the radio, respond to a keyboard button, and fire off a packet when it's necessary, or if you only need to measure the, um, the voltage and display it on the screen. Um, all of the source code is on GitHub. Um, the GitHub wiki documents uh, how some of the applications were written. So like the, the radio remote control application was first written as a tutorial. And you can run through the tutorial in order to write your own. Um, and then all of the hardware and all of the software is free and open. Uh, CAD designs, everything you need for manufacturing. The GoodWatch 30 will include uh, proper centroids so that you can manufacture it in a pick and place machine. Uh, I will not be selling them commercially, and I've already given away all of the PCBs that I brought with me to Komodo. But I can mail them to you, and if you live in a country that does not seize your mail, like Germany, um, <laughs> you might be able to get them. So, all right. Oh, one more. What is the, the cost of the, the components about? The cost of the components is less than $10. Also in Europe. Oh, so 30 euros. <laughs> <laughs> uh, plus, you need, uh, in Germany, you need a registered Gambaha and the VAT information because it's illegal to buy them as an individual person. Uh, but I, uh, Farnell does not, not like selling to individual people. Yeah. Um, yeah, your hacker space might have the necessary stuff to order the components. Uh, I, I, I do my electronics parts in Germany by meeting my buddy in a bar. And uh, I have a, because students can order it, right? So I meet a student in a bar and I'm like, yo, Dimitri, I got your money. You got my shit? And he says, I got your shit, but bitch better have my money. I'm like, I got your money, bitch. <laughs> and then I slide him 200 euro. He slides me a manila envelope. I look inside to see that the parts are there. And then uh, we give each other the thumbs up and go to the bar. And for some reason, like, everyone kept trying to invite us to their after parties. <laughs> Very confusing. Uh, it is nice how enthusiastic they are about black market electronics components and metal envelopes. Uh, any other questions? Yes? How much do you pay for the case? For the case? Um, $15 or 45 euro. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, the exchange rate, I know, but um, it went the, uh, the other way for hotel rooms when I first went to Paris, so maybe it's karma. Um, it, it, um, it fits in all of the calculator watches of the current series, uh, so um, they have cheaper models. Um, you, I believe there's one that you can pick up for maybe $12 in a deal. Uh, but if you consider that you're having like a uh, frequency counter on your wrist wherever you go that can measure everything between 300 and a gigahertz, like that would cost you a lot more than the, uh, the forty dollars or 150 euro that you're going to invest in building it. Then I would invest in a gold watch. They have a gold painted watch. Yes, I know. Um, it, it's just paint on the stainless steel watch, though. Uh, they have a black watch, um, which you saw in the earlier photograph with the hex editor, but the watch band on the black watch does not work for an antenna. So in whichever watch you're, you're placing, you need to consider where you will run your antenna wire. For the, uh, the cheap rubber ones, you can just run the wire out and weave it through the watch uh, in order to provide the sufficient length. So. Have, you, have you considered that there's an uh, arbitrage opportunity between the US version and the European production of this watch? Absolutely. I have considered the arbitrage opportunities, but I've also considered how embarrassing it would be to be caught with an entire suitcase full of uh, cheap calculator watches, <laughs> only for the customs agent to realize that they were calculator watches and not gold watches. Um, <laughs> customs would be laughing at me for years on end. <laughs> Uh, did you order the whole uh, PCB with the parts in it, or you sold it yourself? No, I, I soldered all of these myself. Um, a few others have built their own. Um, it involves O201 components, which are 2 mil by 1 mil. Um, I forget the metric equivalent, but they're really fucking tiny. Um, Should be uh, 600, 200 something of the... SMD. 
Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's about a, a as thick as a piece of paper wide and um, <laughs> twice as long. Uh, so you, you have to hold it with tweezers, and you have to have very good light. Um, you need to get solder that does have lead in it, and steady hands and uh, good lighting, and you're good. Um, it, it's important to have a microscope of some sort uh, to inspect it afterward, because it's very easy to have it soldered on one side but not the other, and to not quite realize that it hasn't bonded. Um, the main chip is uh, 48 QFN or 64 QFN. So um, again, just hold it in the right place, solder one ed one corner, then the other corner, and then fill in the gaps once it's correctly positioned. Um, it looks really, really intimidating before you do it, and you will screw up your very first one, but then you'll know how to do it. And um, afterward, it's not that bad. Uh, I have a friend whose um, hands shake a lot, and he's able to solder them. If you have the proper soldering iron. Yes, do, uh, you do need the proper soldering iron. Do not, under any circumstances, attempt to build this with an iron from a hacker space that has barnacles growing on it. <laughs> <laughs> or that wiggles when you try to connect <laughs> it to the end. Um, you need something with temperature control. And your temperature needs to be high enough to melt the solder, but low enough that it will not burn the fiberglass. Because as you're soldering iron on the pins, you don't want the board to fall apart. Uh, the barnacle irons are particularly bad about this, because the, the barnacles don't conduct much heat, but then the piece next to them does. So as you're wondering why the hell the solder won't melt, you burn the piece right next to it. Uh, yeah. And would it be possible to reflow, make it in a reflow oven? Yes, uh, it is possible to make it in a reflow oven, and the um, almost all of the components are on the top side, uh, with only a few on the bottom side, and the few on the bottom side are all lightweight and will be held by surface tension. So you can solder the bottom first and then flip it and then apply the, the top components. Um, or if you're soldering it with an iron and you have a hot air gun, the hot air gun can then um, cause the solder to melt so that the component lifts off and repositions itself to the correct location by surface tension, which is really cool to watch because you know you got it in close enough and then it just fixes itself in front of your eyes. Uh, it's magical. Yes? Can you, is there a possibility to have bigger like flash in there or bigger, I don't know, yeah. Uh, yes, yeah, so the, the question is, is it possible to add more flash or RAM? The, um, there are some regions of flash memory that are executable that are not part of those 32 kilobytes, so we could extend it to 36 kilobytes. And I know what you're thinking, like, uh, we're rolling in luxury with that. Um, it's also possible to use unused I.O. registers as RAM if you need like, an extra byte or 16-bit word. Um, I've done this in shell code to avoid affecting main RAM, but I will never use this in a product that I will ship. Um, uh, there is room on the PCB for very small memory chips. And thanks to cell phones, very small memory chips are available. I think there are exactly enough I.O. pins available that you could connect the MMC flash chip from a modern cell phone. So if you need like 128 gigabytes in your watch with a 16-bit CPU with four kilobytes of RAM, that is totally possible. I can um, almost run Linux like that. <laughs> <laughs> you could run a, well, your swap file would have some significant wear and tear. Well, Linux from scratch. Yeah. Um, yeah, y y so there's, there's room to add like exactly one more chip if you have something special that you want. If you want a compass, you can do that. If you want an accelerometer, the power budget will fuck you. Um, <laughs> if you want uh, a large memory chip, you can certainly do that, but you need to consider what you're going to use in that memory chip. Um, reading the memory is pretty good. If you try to write 128 gigabytes to that chip, uh, you will not have the power budget for it. Um, the, the power budget is everything in uh, a device this size. 
Um, I don't think that there's room for a second radio for um, the radio filter chain reasons. Um, so as much as I would love to throw like a Nordic RF uh, 24L01 on this and allow it to sniff the traffic from Microsoft wireless keyboards, um, I don't think that there's quite room unless you cut off the main radio. But at least you'd have a good keyboard for your, you know. It would be an excellent keyboard. You'd hit the one and it would come on the screen, you know, you, you could get it off and go, ee, you know. Also in the other direction, you, you type on the keyboard and it attacks your watch software. That would be great. I, I actually have, um, I go to a, a quiz that's in a bar every Sunday night. And we have a consistent team and we play and um, uh, against the other teams. And you're not allowed to use cell phones because if you did, people would just Google the answers. And you're not allowed to have a smartwatch because people would text message the answers to the team that was playing from like a plant who was on the phone outside. And so the guy who runs the quiz, he walks around and he tells everyone to take their watch off. Except for me because we have a running joke that my watch can be used to phone a friend if I can make the watch do it. <laughs> and he thinks this is funny because he thinks it's a regular watch. I think it's funny because I think I have exactly enough code space left to add <laughs> enough of a, a DMR or Moto Turbo client that I can receive a text message from a Motorola amateur radio. <laughs> This will be fun to watch. And the, while receiving is very expensive, I do have the, rece the reception budget to last the entire pub quiz. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was not my initial design goal, but now it's like a very clear requirement. Um, this project is almost complete as far as I'm concerned. The only remaining tasks are to add nifty applications to it and to um, increase the, the power budget a bit more. Um, the device consumes more electricity than it ought to, uh, and I'm not quite sure why. So the, the end power budget ought to wind up being about seven microamps, which will give a year and a half of battery life. Um, at present, the only prototype that I've done quantitative metrics at is like 75 microamps which will kill it after two months. And in practice, they seem to last about three or four months before failing. Uh, I don't know whether this is that the one prototype had flux left on it, or if it's um, an IO pin in the wrong direction, or a, a clock that I forgot to turn off. So I'm now spending my time power profiling it in order to reduce the, the 75 microamps to the seven that I need. Did you research for like some really small battery which you can like load? Uh, so the question was, did I look at other batteries? Um, I found a rechargeable battery that would fit, which is good, um, but its capacity is a third of the regular battery, which is crap, so I won't be using it. Um, there's only so much space. So I, I have 1.6 millimeters of thickness, and I'm already pushing things a bit tighter than the manufacturer intended because my PCB is thicker than the original PCB by like uh, a micron. So um, I don't have the budget to say double the battery size to a CR2032. Um, the only way that I'm going to get better battery life is through auditing the code, figuring out where the power is spent and fixing that. Um, Texas Instruments actually makes a debugger that will track um, like the power consumption per unit time, give you a graph of the current consumption, and then also allow you to uh, set breakpoints by power consumption. So like if the power consumption jumps up, you can then halt the CPU, look to see which function it's in, and know where your power is being spent. In my case, um, the power consumption is flat, it's just too high. So my next attempts will be to, um, I, I have the LCD controller in like the, the strongest mode because I want to keep the, um, the contrast as good as possible. So if I make controllable contrast, then I ought to be able to make the LCD controller use less power. Uh, I can also start turning things off one at a time and looking to see 
how that affects the load. Like if I turn the real time clock off and all the power consumption goes away, then I know that the real time clock is to blame for the excess consumption. Or the same for the LCD or, or the rest. Um, and then I can uh, fix it and then turn the feature back on. Uh, yes, one more. Why don't you take off, uh, turn off the LCD during sleeping hours and switch on the button? Because sleeping hours are when I do my best coding. <laughs> <laughs> and daylight hours are when I do my best sleeping. Um, yeah, for, for those of us with insomnia, scheduled events aren't going to work. Um, I, I also don't know that the LCD code is to blame. Like I said, it could be excess flux on the board. It could be that um, uh, something is misconfigured somewhere. It's a bug that takes four months to hurt you. So it's a bit slow to find the cause. But I'm getting there. I'll have it pretty soon. Um, and then the, the last thing with this is that if you want to play with it, you should plan to build two. You need one that is connected by USB to your laptop for development. And then you also need a separate one which is not connected, which you will use for wearing. Um, it, it's a bit of an involved process to disassemble it and connect the probes. So. All right, thank you kindly.